I would like to introduce my friend and co-producer, Daniel Wildcat. Oh, some lay, some lay. Uh, I gave a song, uh, say that gi. Zoya ha, yuti ha, let's go gi. Good morning, everyone. How are you? I tell you, I am so excited about this second day of the Fall Festival. Um, you know, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, what's exciting about this festival is that we're affirming that if you want to learn about Indians, you don't go to a museum to just look at old things. You learn about who we are right now, today, and some of the incredible creativity creativity that's embodied, uh, drawing on our traditions, drawing on ancient wisdom, and that's the source of, of ultimately this idea of indigenous ingenuity. We're drawing on that, and we're going to take some of that ancient wisdom and knowledge to help solve modern problems. By the way, we didn't create a lot of the problems. We're looking at the world. You can't lay at the feet of the Choctaw, the Pueblo, the Chickasaw, the Comanche, the Passamaquoddy. And so um, I'm really hopeful about the future when I get, uh, you know, share a program with uh, bright young people and, and, and who are doing just such incredible creative work. So the panel we've got uh, today uh, is the following. I'm going to do a, a brief introduction before we get started here. So we are kicking off today with the indigeners. So we're going to welcome uh, Dr. Lee Francis the fourth of the Pueblo of Laguna, and uh, the head indigener, CEO and founder of Red Planet BNC. Uh, Johnny uh, Diacon of the Muscogee Creek Nation, a uh, uh, mural artist who painted the Trail of Tears mural on the south exterior wall of Mona. And who, as right, if you're watching Reservation Dogs, you might catch some of his work. Um, Johnny J, who is Oto, Missouri, and Choctaw, and the founder of a tribe called Geek. And last but not least, I get to share a session here with Weody Old Bear again of the Comanche Nation. And if you missed her discussion of indigenous futurism yesterday, uh, when we get that posted, you know, in a, a week or two after all of this shindig is done, be sure you check that out. So um, the idea here is today is just have a discussion about pop culture, comics, gaming, creative uh, toys, uh, sci-fi, fantasy pop culture, all of this stuff where we really have in young indigenous people that are really kind of helping shape what's going on today. So with that, um, I'm just going to kind of open the floor and, and say, well, let's, let's, uh, let's start the discussion. And so I don't know who'd like to kick it off, but let's dive into it. I think we're going to have some fun. Okay, it looks like we're all just kind of sitting here being cool. <laughs> um, Go ahead, Johnny. Run run with it, Johnny. Run with it. All right. Since everyone's being cute here, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, I think if this is going to be a great conversation because pop culture is such a huge part of Native culture. It's a mm -hmm. huge part of our youth culture. You know, growing up, I was a huge Star Wars fan and I attribute my love for Star Wars as part of my survival um, because I am a suicide survivor. And when I was younger, I didn't really feel like I fit in any place. I was kind of geeky. I was a little nerdy, <laughs> but I never really felt like I belonged anywhere. But it was within the Star Wars fandom, like going to conventions and meeting up with other fans that, you know, I felt like I belonged. Like they didn't care that I was a nerd. They didn't care that, you know, I knew more about Star Wars <laughs> than I did sports um, and growing up in Oklahoma, sports is huge, especially within native communities. And so, you know, like just geek culture has always just been a part of who I am. Like I remember running around with my brothers and sisters and playing lightsabers with sticks and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just 
the arguments in my family because part of my family is Star Trek fans, the other part Star Wars. So very heated debates. Um, so like, I, I really love that now we're able to have these conversations and really just kind of out ourselves as indigenous and just kind of own that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, that's a great point. And, and yeah, I mean, having this, uh, creating spaces and places, you know, where young people can do that, I think is, is really in, incredible. Yeah. Who wants to pick up on this, on this theme of, Contemporary indigenous pop culture. Don't be bashful. All right, I'll jump in. That'll be good. I'll follow <laughs> Johnny, which is always a hard act to follow. So, uh, <laughs> Guazzi, Halpa, everybody, Lee Francis the Fourth uh, from the Pueblo of Laguna. I, I also like Johnny was a huge nerd uh, growing up, and it came really honestly because, like, my dad was really like a sci-fi and fantasy guy. Um, and could find those parallels, right, about indigenous representation. Um, but as I dug into it, the thing about natives, really the native identity for me, and I've done the academic, I'll, uh, you know, the academic ease and the academic work on this, right? We were talking about this before we jumped yeah. on. But, and that's why I think I live in pop culture is that, is, is that it's, it's, it's accessible, but it's really where the native identity has been formed because for 300 years, we didn't control the representations of ourselves in popular culture. Mm -hmm. We were trying to fight for our lives. We were trying to just right. literally exist and not die at the hands right. of a colonizer right. that was bent on killing us all. Right. So mm -hmm. we didn't have control of the media since 16, since the mid 1600s, we've had the noble savage riding on horseback with the six pack and a bow and arrow you know, and, yeah. and, and the, and the, the, the flowing headdress and the, you know, the beautiful hair he's, you know, I mean, he's Dallas Goldtooth, right. In res dogs, right. That's literally <laughs> the, that's the iconography in, you know, in, in, in what we see. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but we never, because we didn't have control of the media, it was someone else mm -hmm. that was always portraying us. So it was mm -hmm. whatever the whims were of the historical popular culture at the time. So we went from the noble savage to the vanishing mm -hmm. Indian, which is the last of the Mohicans. You yeah. know, we were always, the, it was always somebody was the last of. So it was this right. transference that we were all dying off and we were transferring our, mm -hmm. our land and our native magic, you know, mm -hmm. our, our magical nativeness yeah. from the noble savage yes. to our, our white brethren who were going to carry on for us. I mean, it's right. literally how the Boy Scouts started, right? They're like, right. well, the natives are dead. So we'll take all their traditions and we'll go do their dances and stuff. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, and then you hit the Red Devil period where we're all villains, and that's the Cowboys mm -hmm. and Indians, and John Wayne gunning us down whenever he possibly can. Mm -hmm. And then we hit the turn of the century. Now we're starting to, like, rewrite our own narratives because we're kind of finally getting into publishing. You know, mm -hmm. we're finally, you're Charles Eastman and, and Morning Dove, and you're seeing that in Native Lit, and you're seeing, you know, cinema coming out. Early cinema was filmed on the res. Like, the earliest, mm -hmm. some of the earliest cinema was actually filmed mm -hmm. with Natives. It was reservation. Right. You know, they, they were res-based, right, because it was so easy to go in there. Right. Because like nobody can like you can just film it and it's cheap, especially in Southern California. And so, you know, so now you get this kind of new native, you know, get this new wave. But now it's all the tragic chief. Like we're all dead, but there's like three of us left. And that person is right. very, like he's yeah. a chief of his people. And he's so sad. He's like, I know my people have died and it is so terrible. Right. So for me, this whole idea of being an indigenous nerd is really taking back these narratives that exist in science fiction, mm -hmm. fantasy stories that we've told since time immemorial and pushing back against this continuous, uh, that, that was never our narrative in the first place. Right. right? Like right. we get to be what we want to be. I'm sitting here just like, you know, I'm like, I'm, we're talking on zoom right now. Right. Like this is crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, here's a whole bunch of natives, man. This is not what pop popular culture thinks that we'd be like, here's your blanket. And we got smoke signals going out to each other. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not true. We're all like STEM and smart. We're sending stuff to Mars. We're, we're astronauts and rockets and we're superheroes. And I think mm -hmm. that's why I exist in, that's why I love this term indigenous. nerds, why I take it on, you know, for me and mm -hmm. why I absolutely uh, adore being a part of this. So, yeah, great. Well, such a, such a great point. I mean, you know, the narratives uh, have that are dominant, in, in culture are about us. They're never by us. And I think this is what you're representing. 
that, hey, we're going to tell the story now. And I, I think that's just wonderful. Good point. Yeah. Who wants to, who's got something they'd like to say next? Well. <laughs> okay. Here I am. Um, it was, that's really, um, I well, there are so many things I want to talk back to, uh, um, all these great things everybody's saying so far. I mean, I was, it's really interesting, Johnny talking about the Star Wars thing, because I, as my kind of refuge as a kid, because I wasn't, I had a, a, a white dad I saw maybe once a year. And mm -hmm. I lived with my grandparents and I felt a little weird sometimes with other kids my age as the pinkest person. And um, I really got into, and we came from a military family. You know, Indians joined the military more than anybody mm -hmm. in the US. And I really went in for Star Trek big time. And I yeah. think that's one of the interesting divides because it's and it, it is i love star trek and i was telling dan this yesterday i love star trek but i recognize that it is an idealized colonial point of view yeah where everybody wants to join the you know star mm -hmm. you know the um federation of planets which is an idealized colonial setup it's an idealized empire Except and, for DS9. I'm just going to nerd out for a second because yeah, Deep true. Space and Nine was say, the only like, one that broke away from that, right? So anyway, that that's, some, that's some nerd stuff. <laughs> incarnation. That is the best incarnation um, because it is breaks away from that. But it was a narrative that I understood, you know, as a kid who, you know, my grandmother was one of the first uh, women Marines and one of the first like the second indigenous woman to be in the Marine Corps during World War II. So I, the mil that was something that I knew about um, mm -hmm. growing up. But that's, and about, you know, that narrative that of the, all the different fa colonizer fantasies that are projected mm -hmm. onto yeah. Indians. It was funny because as a little kid, um, when my, when my Gaku and my maternal grandmother was my age, she spent, we spent several days a week at the Comanche Elderly Center collecting stories. And she had this huge real, you know, this I'm giving away that I am not such a young person. Uh, she had this huge reel to reel recorder that she would drag with her down there and record all these really old, you know, older people uh -huh. hanging, who hung out and collected stories. They were so much weirder than anything that any um that any white person wrote about us there yes. was so much weirder there there are stories about an um a medicine man you know guy back in the day who had a fabulous power of becoming small we have a lot of stories about getting the power to get really little and that he had a submarine made out of a gourd that he used to travel the creeks um, yeah. and we have stories about that belong to my family about a little white dog who can travel to other dimensions um mm -hmm. because we're weird we're so much Indians are so much weirder than anyone imagines um <laughs> than so any settler has ever imagined we're strange and so this we're fantastical people. I mean, we have a fantastical, every tribe I have ever met has a fantastical imagination and a fantastical world, uh, uh, just a fabulous, rich worldview that mm -hmm. uh, settlers don't even imagine. Like yeah. that, that the colonial culture has no idea about. Um, yeah. Yeah, oh. that's 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 I mean, that's such a great point, because, uh, again, so everyone would think, oh, well, this is this is so new for indigenous people. And like we were talking about yesterday, 
No, not really. If we go back to our oldest stories and our traditions, we're going to tell some stories that you're going to go like, oh, wow, that's fantastic. That's, you know, uh, uh, magical. And and as go, no, this is the world we live in. <laughs> and I think it's it's really cool, you know, to to, you know, talk about that. And so, uh Let's get the other Johnny in here because his artwork is kind of the embodiment of, of, you know, building bridges, you know, past, present, future technology, all of that. So, Johnny, what are you thinking? Boy, in the, in the, in the 60s, 60s um, Star, Star Trek, Trek. That, was, that was one of my gateways into it. Uh, I learned how to read from my mother before I went to school. She, she uh, taught me how to read using comic books. So those old '60s, those original uh, Spider-Man and the Incredible Hulk, that's what I learned how to read, and that was my introduction to them. Um, Star Trek, you know, I, I love Star Trek, and it's another one of those things with representation that we're seeing now that they I didn't see as a child in the '60s. Um, it wasn't there. Well, I saw of Indians, indigenous people. I got you know, from F Troop or that show, that horrible show, Custer, that was uh, on ABC in the 60s. Uh, Gunsmoke, that's where you saw your native representation. So I, I, I didn't identify with that. That wasn't me, you know, that's not the people I grew up with or knew or related to. We weren't that. But Star Trek, there was Spock. I identified with Spock. Not only did I have the same haircut as Spock did as a child with straight black hair, but I was different, like Spock. Spock was with a bunch of people that he was not the same as. And I was growing up, my father was a sign painter, and he moved us out of Oklahoma into Arkansas. Well, that was different. <laughs> I was the darkest kid in my schools. I stuck out. So I could identify with Spock. He was different, but he was special. And I always noticed in these in the star, episodes of Star Trek, they always turned to Spock. Spock had special abilities that he could get him out of things. He was smart. He was stronger. You know, and I identified with more with that than I would see these Indians on F Troop, you know, playing the fool. And then white kids acting that way to me because they thought that's how I should act. You know, so the, and so I became introverted that way, and I became more involved in art, and so that's that you know society and just my interest you know, grew into that, and then sci-fi. I really love sci-fi. Um, you know, being native uh, in '72, Silent Running. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. It was kind of an ecology-based movie. I love that movie. One of my favorite movies of all times, and just that that message they were about taking care of the environment and the land that resonated with me so you know and this is this all hit me then when star wars came you know it was just you know <laughs> I, I, I was like in uh, junior high when that came out and you know i just I, it, it hasn't stopped for me you know i just keep creating and, and of course now you know i'm being native uh, with my art and everything, that's, it just comes out that when I want to see these things, I think of them in the native mind. And so a lot of my artwork comes out, uh, the comic book work I do, thanks to Lee that got me in, involved in that. It was just something I was dabbling in, you know, kind of like in the basement thing for my own amusement. Uh, he brought me out. He's, I showed him some of my work one day and he said, you got to get this out there. And it's the same thing my dad did with my paintings. Uh, I was just doing them at the house. And he said, no, you got to get these out there. And uh, so, you know, uh, that's, that's my, that's my, uh, that's where I started. <laughs> yeah, that's a, Well, that's a, that's a great story. And certainly uh, I can identify with that. In fact, you know, I was um, uh a child of, of the 60s, a coming of age in, in the late 60s. But I grew up uh, with, I, I don't know if you guys remember, a Phil called black and white TV. And the first TV representation I remember watching, I kid you not, was 
uh, the Lone Ranger. And of course, there was his side. There was Tonto beside him, and and I remember to this day, you know, my brother and I we watched that show and we're going like, Tonto's an idiot. What's going on with this guy? You know, and 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 uh, so what do we do? I'm I I think my mom destroyed this picture, but there was a fan club thing. We wrote in, and we got the eight by ten copies we had one photo of the lone ranger and his horse with that white horse he rode and then we had a picture of tonto on his indian pony and and i i can tell you you can imagine which one got center center feature of course it was the lone ranger you know and and i think what i like about what this whole discussion is is see this is what Lee opened us up with. We're, we're taking back, you know, our our stories, and we're we're going to represent ourselves, not let someone else, you know, try to tell the world who we are. And and that's really powerful. That's really powerful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It really is powerful, and it's really needed too. Um, you know, when I started a tribe called Geek, I had been working with Native Max Magazine, which was the first Native fashion magazine. Mm -hmm. And it really opened my eyes that, you know, there are these needs for us to show that we are a part of very different industries. And pop culture is one of the hugest industries in the world. Like we're all connected through pop culture. Like if you go to a foreign country and you're wearing mm -hmm. a Star Wars shirt, you know, somebody is going to be able to recognize yeah. that and they recognize these stories and these themes. So our fandoms are things that connect us. And, you know, like for me growing up, you know, I love Star Wars. Um, I love discussing the native representation within Star Wars. And, you know, but I'm also a huge fan of Harry Potter. And I mm -hmm. love like all these different subcultures within geek culture, you know, cosplaying and, you know, like different anime and just all these different things that are part of pop culture, but it's very hard to be a native fan. Um, you look at what happened with Harry Potter. You know, I was excited when they announced that with um, Wizards in America, you know, that they were going to be bringing in native history and native representation. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of high hopes. I knew that she wasn't going to get it right. She wasn't going to get it perfect, mm -hmm. but I had hope that at least it would open up that dialogue. And that yeah. maybe she would do some research. And then when it came out, it was such a huge disappointment. Um, not from my perspective as a Choctaw. I think that she got the Choctaw elements right. A um, little bit of problems. But for the most part, it showed that she did research. Um, you know, she went back and she used spelling variations that were used. Um, and a lot of people didn't mm -hmm. know that those variations were used. And they were like, oh, well, she's making a mockery of the Choctaw people. And it's like, no, these are variations of how, you know, how settlers spelled Choctaw because they didn't know mm -hmm. Choctaw. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, you know, she did research. She did a lot of research yeah. and she got the Choctaw elements right. Where she messed up was when she tried to pull in Navajo stories and Navajo folklore. And you could tell that she didn't put the same time and care into those stories and that representation mm -hmm that she did in other areas. And for me, that was the most disappointing part because she had shown that she was capable of doing the research, of reaching out and collaborating. But for this part of the story, you know, and with a different tribe, for some reason, she just didn't have that same care or that same level mm -hmm. of respect. And it, that's what was disappointing, was just mm -hmm. the lack of disrespect you know, or the mm -hmm. lack of respect. And it kind of goes with all your fandoms, you know, I love Doctor Who. I grew up watching Doctor Who with my dad. And, you know, there are several episodes where they went back to deal with indigenous people. <laughs> and it was so cringy. And, you know, like you're part of these fandoms and you get this, get excited, you know, when you hear that there's going to be Native Americans or, you know, that there's Natives involved. You get excited because we didn't see ourselves represented back then. Mm hmm and then you watch it and you're just like, Ew. <laughs> you know, and whether you realize it or not, like that affects the way that we view ourselves. 
Yeah. And the way that we view our cultures, you know, even on just subconscious levels, you know, there's a lot, there's this impact that it has where, you know, you're just like, Oh, well, you know, if that's how we are, then I don't want to be that. Or I don't want to, you know, like start seeing that history and that language as being something that's kind of archaic or not needed. You know, mm-hmm. just because of how it's portrayed, like it, you're seeing it played as something that's backward and primitive right. and that there's no need. And so you start thinking, OK, well, you know, I'm going to move away from this. But right. you know, so I think it's important that we do reclaim those narratives because, you know, our languages, our cultures, our communities, they're so beautiful, so powerful. And, you know, the knowledge that we have is the basis of all modern science. Like it's Mm -hmm. important. (laughs) And, Mm -hmm. you know, so I think it is like, it's a beautiful thing that we're doing now where we're being able to tell our own stories to get back in there. And, you know, we already was talking about how our stories are so much more fantastic than anything that, you know, non-natives can dream up. And, you Mm -hmm. know, I say this all the time when I'm talking to our youth that we need to remember that we are the science fiction of our ancestors right now. You know, we talk about indigenous futurisms as something fictional, but for me, it's an everyday practice because the things that we are creating and dreaming about have an application in the future. Like they're yeah. helping to forge yeah. new paths forward. So I think it's really important, like the work that everybody is doing just to bring yeah. about more authentic native representation. I really like that last point, Johnny. Uh, we, Odie, and I were talking about this yesterday, you know, I, and, and I apologize, and I should have looked it up, but there is a First Nations people in Canada, and, and part of their whole worldview is, is they believe, you know, that the future is, they dream the future before it really happens, and that kind of really ties in with what you all are talking about, you know, you're, you're, you sort of, you know, dream, envision, enact something that, you know, their their notion was that anything that's really important will be confirmed by dreams before we ever do it, you know. And, and so this is really a part of a very ancient way of thinking, you know, about the world, about time and space and reality. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Great. I had to <laughs> I I'm I'm all uh, a Twitter with everything that you said Johnny and it was funny that immediately talking about the whole representation and the cringy thing X-Files can we talk about the X-Files for a minute yeah how uh-huh. much I can love and hate a show at the same time yeah uh, every you know, every non-Native episode, I pretty much love most of, you know, 99% of them. Every time there's a show, an episode with Natives in it, I had to run in the bathroom. But I'm like, oh, this is just too embarrassing. I can't keep watching this. <laughs> uh, and and as much as I would get excited to see Floyd Westerman, you know, and I'd go, oh, I want to see Floyd. Oh, I can't believe they're saying these things. Yeah. And um, it's kind of interesting how even now things really can let you down um the watchman uh the hbo watchman it was so great to see them talking about bass reeves being a really pivotal pivotal part of the storytelling and who i don't know if you're if everybody's aware of this but he was the person that the lone ranger was based on and he was a black man and Mm -hmm. But and his there was a Comanche guy that he traveled and did a lot of work with, and he was an elected policeman of the Comanche Nation, mm-hmm. um, named Pahoxica. And I'm like, how can you make this great? I mean, it was a great show set in Oklahoma, and just have no natives. Just <laughs> we're like they just went poof and. Uh, and I mean, I, it was really well written and it was really well done. And I loved seeing the whole, everything about the black history of Oklahoma, which is great. I mean, Oklahoma at one time had more all black towns than any other state in the union. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you don't get representation right by l- suddenly leaving out all the natives. 
-hmm. It's not an either or. We need to represent. I mean, if you're going to write a story about Oklahoma, um, I want you to put our black relatives in there, but you don't, you shouldn't erase the, <laughs> the natives. It's not, you know, it's, this yeah. is a nuanced, complex state. Yeah. We have a nuanced, complex history. Um, you're not getting it right when you leave out either one. Yeah, um, yeah. So. Well, at least been chomping at the bit to get something yeah. in. Hey, Lee. Well, and I, I think the, I mean, I think it's it goes back to really where and who we're telling the story, right? Because I, if I recall correctly on social media, there was a pushback against reservation dogs for not including our, bra our black relatives, right? Black Muscogee relatives in Oklahoma. So I yeah. think we're at this really critical point because when I talk about pop culture, it's not just misrepresentation for native folks. It's also the erasure, right? So exactly to mm -hmm. your point, Weody, which is the fact of like, but I think we picked up certain traits from pop culture colonization where we're kind of also in this sense of erasure, even when we're telling stories or when others are telling stories about us as well, because we're still in these moments, right? So this one was really important because they were black, uh, you know, black and African-American uh, showrunners, right? So they wanted to tell the story about, you know, the Tulsa massacre. They wanted to tell the story about Bass Reeves, right? Mm -hmm. That became the central point to it. And, you know, and, and when we look at other things that, you know, where are we looking at, at, at the inclusivity? And I think that it's this constancy, and I'm going to always point back at colonial pop culture. This mm -hmm. is, we, we're only given a certain amount of time in Hollywood. Oh, you can't tell this story. Oh, you can't tell that story. Oh, we're not going to tell this story. I'm like, for you know, f right now we're working on a story around, um, I'm working with the relatives of Tarzan Brown, Ellison Brown. So if mm -hmm. you know that name won the Boston Marathon twice, was in the Olympics with Jesse Owens, except pop culture only allows one person of color. Right, white right. pop culture only allows one person of color to be their champion right then. There were three men of color at that, uh, that not 36 Olympics. Mm -hmm. Tarzan was one of them, and there were two black men, including Jesse Owens, as part of that contingency that went to go take down the epitome of white supremacy, right? right. But we don't know that in our mythologies. The mythology only allows one, you know, one person of color at a time because we can't have them all at a time. We can't tell all of these stories. We can only tell one story about one person of color. That's it. Because if we start connecting each other, well, now we have a problem with the white hegemony because they're going to start to get real nervous when we all start to think like, hey, you know what? This is really interesting. We got family and kin and we all connected early on because you wouldn't let us into your clubs and you wouldn't let us all connect up with each other. And y'all controlled the media and wouldn't let us tell our own stories. And we got a lot of people that we're, you know, that we're relatives with. Huh. There may be an issue. Mm -hmm. right? we, there may be mm -hmm. an issue if we start to get why, if, if we start to catch wise. So I think in terms of something, I loved Watchmen as well. And I recognized that I was like, wow, we kind of are missing. Like, I was like, it's Tulsa, Oklahoma. 1921 is kind of an important year because that's also the height of the Osage murders. Mm -hmm. But that's not, that, I'm not going to tell Watchmen that that's their story. You know what? For me. And I know all, all y'all, because y'all writers and artists, is like, that's my responsibility. I don't expect HBO to, to come to my defense and tell me to write that. I got to write that. And I'm mm -hmm. dang sure going to write that, right? So, Excellent. you know, I, that's what I'm working on. Awesome. 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 Yeah. Yeah. You know, th and this this really, you know, um, uh Johnny, you have you have any comment on this this whole idea about representation and and uh, I'm thinking about some of your art and uh, it's definitely not the Santa Fe. All of it's not that you know it doesn't fit the Santa Fe Bambi Native art motif. You know, and I think have you had to deal with this issue of people saying, well, what's native about this? Yeah, yeah, I have, um, because, you know, my art, uh, it's me, I, I paint my people the Muscogee, which is uh, southeastern culture, completely different, most uh, non-natives think of as Indian, 
they get the, like we were talking about earlier, the spirit, you know, the, the William Knife Man, uh, the Dallas Gold Tooth on the horse with the flowing hair and the, the buffalo hunts and all that. When they think of Indians and Indian arts, that, that's what they want to see. I'll paint something that's Muscogee based, uh, a stomp dance or something, um, you know, just of any, everyday general life out of a Muscogee life very Indian. It's very, you know, it's a traditional scene, it's a traditional setup, but non-native people don't recognize that because that's not what they're used to seeing, what they expect. So a lot of times my art will be liked because of they like how it's put together, but they can't relate to that subject as being Indian. So they'll pass it and go to maybe something that's more uh, a war bonnet. That's the Indian. That's what they want. They want Indian art, you know. That's so. Uh, but you know, I stay true, true to who I am, and uh, I paint from the heart, and I paint from a people. So I paint what I want to paint, <laughs> you know. And uh, you know, if, if you're a Muscogee or you know Southeastern or know that culture, they love it, and that's who I'm doing that for. And so when I paint those pictures. That's who I want to enjoy it. Um, but also, I would like to take the opportunity to say, yeah, this is who we are. This is what we do. Uh, we're here. You know, we live amongst you. We work with you. Um, th this is what we do. And so, welcome to our world. You know, we know yours. We watch your TV shows. We go to your schools. We participate in your society. This is ours, you know. And so... Um, yeah, I mean, representation matters. And I can see why, you know, we talk about the reservation dogs. Uh, they're saying, well, there's, there's no black natives represented in this show. But, you know, I don't think about that when I watched the one episode, the first episode, with the angry man who had his chip truck stolen. I didn't think of him as a black man. He was an angry man. He could have been any, any race. If that would have happened, he would have been angry about that. But then also again, I do not know his, his family history. Maybe he was a mixed race man. You know, I didn't ask to see the man's CDIB card, you know, to <laughs> confirm this. I just assumed that he possibly could have been. Just like anybody I see, I don't know. You know, but yeah, I mean... But I, I also I think, you know, with this thing, we're just excited right now because we're putting our stuff out there. So we may miss certain things, including groups. It's like when you're in a group and someone's got control of the microphone like I do right now and I'm doing all the talking, everybody on me, because I'm excited to be here and representing and talking. And I may not give Lee a chance or John, you're in, you know, because... I'm talking, but I'm excited about it. But we're all here as a group. But eventually we all get a chance. And I think as, as time comes on and that show evolves, it's only been eight episodes and we're just starting to learn the main characters. We have brought in the rest of the community. We haven't brought in too much. So I said, give it time. It'll come. It'll come. You couldn't, MASH didn't explain the whole Korean War. You know, <laughs> in the first eight episodes. You, you had to let it grow. Characters had to come in. Stories had to be developed. You'll learn more. More people come in. So I say, I say, give it a chance. And I'm sure it is. And as they learn, they hear these new ideas, inputs coming in. I've, I've got a great feeling about this show. And I'm not just saying it because you can see my art and little scenes in there around there. I've been waiting for this show since I was a little kid. <laughs> and so when yeah. Rutherford Falls came out, yeah, this is great, you know, uh, finally getting to see something. You know, I was excited back when Northern Exposure was on because there was Indians there and they were actually coming out and being people and doing their things. And they were serious and goofy and they're just Indian people, you know, and interacting yeah. with the people around them. And, and so, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just excited. I'm hyped right now because this is a great time, you know, with... Uh, Everything that everybody's doing, the pop culture, um, you know, Baby Yoda, you know, the Indians yeah. taking him. Yeah, I mean, if you heard of Bear Son walking, you know, non-Indians taking to him because, you know, it's just, 
everything we relate to, pop culture-wise, you know, like I was saying earlier, we're part of the society too, so yeah, we're going to love, you know, superheroes. Yeah, we've got superheroes. We like these superheroes, you know. It's, it's just a great time, and <laughs> I, I don't know what else to say other than that, but I'm, I'm just excited, yeah. Well, uh, it looked like you were getting ready to say something a while ago. No, I was just really, like, just pointing out, like, Northern Exposure, you know, yeah. Lane Miles. I, I used to watch oh. that at the house, right? Oh. And I think it's that whole awesome. idea of, because of that erasure, right? Like, because we haven't been present in so much media, like, when we would find these instances of, like, something we could gravitate towards. That's why it's yeah. so important to have a Reservation Dogs. It's so important to have, you know, a Rutherford Falls, where we're actually main characters. And of course, there's mm -hmm. still work, more work to be done. I don't think we can rest on our laurels, but like, man, I remember that. I remember Predator. Do Billy yeah. Soul? Like, oh, I yeah. do the native things when I used to go, when we used to all be able to go out, I'd go to bed and I'd just do this, you know? And the native guys <laughs> in the crowd, like, everybody would know. They'd be just like, Predator, yep, Billy Soul, baby, you know? And I was like, <laughs> yeah. Because when I watched it, I was like, here's the native guy. He gets through the whole, almost through the whole movie more than any of the other folks. He's the only one that recognizes the danger because of traditional stories, right? Because it's stories yeah. from his people that are like, yeah. oh, no, our people were the fiercest wars. They already came down. Like, we yeah. already know what happened. And yeah. it's the warrior's death at the end. He's yeah. the only guy that had, like, outside of the main hero, like, he's the only other guy. For me, that was so impactful, right? Like, seeing yeah. these deliberate moments. And he wasn't wearing, you know, he wasn't in a headdress. He was just one of the bros. Like he was just yeah. like, I always talk about when I was like, Hollywood wants to do diversity, do Predator. Like they were a diverse group that didn't talk about their diversity or right. represent themselves right. in the diverse ways. It was just like, yeah. yo, he had the, you know, the, the same thing, the look, all he had was like long hair. That was it. Yeah. He had like yeah. 80s long hair. It wasn't like <laughs> native long hair. It was like 80s, you know, he had like the 80s cut. Right. And that's why, you know, People always get surprised by me and they're just like Predator. And I was like, it's the only movie that was diverse without being di like, without focusing yes. on diversity. It's like, hey, you know what? We're just going to get the greatest warriors ever and they're all going to go down and get killed by an alien. And I was like, yeah. cool, sold. So <laughs> you know, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that's really an important point too. And, and um, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, if Disney calls or someone calls and says, hey, we really want you to do this or we want you to do that, that you're going to turn it down because you're thinking, well, they're just trying to do check the ODEI box, diversity, equity and inclusion. Uh, I, you know, I, I think we're aware of that. We know what the environment is we're in right now. But what I think is is interesting is. What I hear all of you saying is, hey, it, it, you know, you can think you're checking the box, but what you're going to get is our stories, our reality. Don't think we're going to give you, yeah, this um, feel good, you know, um, uh, stereotypical notion of, you know, kumbaya with natives. It's it's not going to be that way, you know. It's gonna it's gonna be something that might be a little rugged around the edges, you know, and 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 might have, um, uh, you know, profanity. It might be real, and and I think that to me is 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 really the hopeful part of the work. You know, all of you are engaged in. Yeah. So we're getting down to probably having about, oh, let's see, looks like probably um, about 15 minutes left before we um, entertain some some questions. We're getting some great comments from Facebook, folks. So great. Keep sending them in. Anyone who's watching this on Facebook, send us questions. We're going to I'm going to go around and ask everyone, each of you, final thoughts and um then let's open it up for questions, man. That's where the that's where the learning happens. Let's get it. Let's get some questions. And so uh, send those questions in. They'll get sent over to me, and we'll field them as best we can. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go back to uh, Weody. Weody, 
uh, your final thoughts on this great discussion. Well, I just, you know, I had thought about it before and it went out of my mind as soon as we were all started going back and forth. But we need to, I want to acknowledge one of my big heroes in pop culture, who was a writer who just passed away very recently, was Russell Bates. Um, he wrote for animated Star Trek. Um, he's a Kiowa from Anadarko, not far from where I grew up. I know his nieces. Um, he, but he, as a little girl, he was a huge inspiration to me. He wrote for Star Trek animated series, Kolchak. Um, he wrote for a lot of the uh, 70s early morning live action shows. Isis, if you remember that, uh, there were there was Isis, Jason and the Argonauts, and um, Shazam with Billy Batson. It wasn't about being Native. It was from a Native perspective. Yeah. And, yeah. You, you know, for me, the idea that here was a grown-up, who um who was a native whose family my family knew who was out there in hollywood writing stories that were on my tv was one of the most thrilling things and inspired me as a kid and kept me going through long a long dry period as a writer um just the existence and the life of russell bates was a huge inspiration to me and yeah. i wanted to you know, make a shout out to him and his his fiction his was great. Um, um, he has a great piece. Oh, now the it just see it slipped right out of my head about um, a warrior fighting something and he doesn't know what it is. An invisible enemy who turns out to be smallpox in yeah. one of his. Um, some of his prose, his short prose. Yeah, yeah. He's just amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Johnny, Johnny J, what are you thinking? Final thoughts? Well, I'm always excited by these conversations, uh, mainly because, you know, me and Lee have these conversations all the time when we talk. And one of the things that we're always talking about is practicing critical nerd theory, which is understanding that nothing that we create or that non-natives create is going to be perfect. You know, that there's always going to be a reason to criticize it. And we need to be critical. But being critical, you know, it doesn't make us haters. It doesn't mean that we want, you know, whatever media that we're critiquing to fail. It's just that we see the areas that it can be better. And, you know, especially with reservation dogs. You know, I grew up in Oklahoma. And the one thing that stuck out to me was the fact that there was no accent. (laughs) <laughs> you know, the, the Oklahoma accent that I have worked so hard to try and fish to the back until I start <laughs> talking with fellow Oklahomans and then it comes out, you know, that was missing for me. And especially within the area that the show was filmed in, you know, those accents are so heavy. And that was one of the things that I kind of missed was that kind of native res yeah. accent, you know, um, <laughs> But there are a lot of little things to critique. But one of the things that I really appreciated about Res Dogs, and it's something that, you know, I'm going to have an article out soon, which is talks about this, is how it addressed mental health in Indian country. And this beautiful way that it addressed the impact of suicide without being preachy and also being very real about how it changes Mm -hmm. our perspectives and the different Mm -hmm. ways that we deal with grief as communities, not just, you know, as individuals, but as a community, you know, this community was touched by this death and it resonated in various ways. And so I really loved that. And I thought it was beautiful. And it's one of the best things about us being able to reclaim our narratives and tell our own stories is that we can do so and not have to sensationalize, not have to dramatize, you know, make it more dramatic or make it just so sensational or hysterical or overly emotional because, you know, it's not the way that emotions flow, like the way that we Hmm. deal with things in the real world. You know, we don't throw ourselves on the ground screaming (laughs) and crying, Um, you know, and natives, we laugh, we get inappropriate. (laughs) You know, we, you go to a native funeral and we're uh, laughing, we're talking, we're visiting and we're happy to be with each other 
you know, even though we're brought together by such sad circumstances. And, you know, I thought that was one of the most beautiful things about Res Dogs was just that it showed Native people just being Native people. The stories were us doing everyday things. They weren't Mm -hmm. always fantastic. They weren't always on some big adventure. They -hmm. were just small things that happen in everyday life. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And, you know, I think that's something that, you know, as we're getting more representation that we need to be aware of that we kind of just need to let the stories unfold. We could be critical. We can, you know, say, oh, you know, I don't think this is, you know, there's something I just don't, that doesn't sit well with me here. But at the same time, you know, we can do that and be critical, but still love that film or still Mm -hmm. love what it's doing and what it represents. And I think that's so important because we live in such a time where, you know, we're all critics, but at the same time, a lot of people take that to, if it's not perfect, they want to throw the whole thing away and, you know, just chuck it out and pretend it never existed. But, you know, that's not the reality and nothing in this world is perfect. And natives know that more than anyone Because even in our beadwork, you know, we don't always do everything perfect. You always put in a bead that isn't the right color or you mess up the design just a little bit, you know, as part of our tradition. And so, you know, I think that's really important that we can't really expect perfection. You know, Mm -hmm. we're doing the best we can and that's all we can do. And, you know, our stories, you know, it's always going to be who's in control of that story. And it's always going to be their story. And what they're trying to get out into the world. And I think that's really important because sometimes not everything is for, you know, us as an individual, but Mm -hmm. as a collective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Johnny. Lee, I'm going to turn to you. Final thoughts. Yeah. uh, I will echo Johnny. I think that's the part on critical nerd theory, uh, Uh you know, that we've kind of coined this term, which is how are we in marginalized communities, you know, really thinking about critically uh, thinking about the things that we love and not having to just dismiss them. Like there are cringy right. issues of, right. you know, in Star Trek, there are cringy issues in Star Wars and Harry Potter. Does that mean I have to stop? I can. And you can totally right. not want to because of commercial interests or whatever, but but I think it requires more thought, right? I think the, mm-hmm. the, the critical nature of that is to really think through many of these things because we're so subsumed by, by social media, right? Like we all exist there in one way or another or are impacted Mm -hmm. by it in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And that kind of drives a huge part of the conversation when it's like, just like what you're saying is like, Hey, just take a moment, let the story come out. I just remember all, I mean, there was Captain America and they made the joke about it in uh, winter soldier. And then an end game, which is when he leans in an end game and he's like, hail Hydra. Dude, when Cap did that in Winter, like he did that in the Captain America comic book, everybody lost their minds. They're like, Captain America would never do this. And I was like, have any of you ever read comics? Like, seriously, (laughs) like we retcon characters all the time. Let the story go through first. Yeah. Yeah. Then launch your criticism. It can't just be like right out the gate, but social media is everybody just Mm -hmm. pops on, you know, instantaneously. So the critical nerd theory is thinking through these things. And Good. remembering that they're, these things that we love are really important to us, right? Yeah. And as I always say, and I'll, I'll close with this, as I always say, support indigenous, support native creatives. Like we want to continue to make this work. It can't just be the res dogs of the world. That's awesome. But it's got to be the Johnny Daikons. It's got to be the Wayotes. It's got to be a tribe called Geek. It's got to be your comic book makers. It's got to be your, you know, your little tchotchke artists, your little anime kids that are just doing yeah. little side kind of stuff at the powwows. Support their work. Because this is like we're we're living in this world and they're doing such amazing things. They are sparking the indigenous imagination. They're not focusing on tragedy. They're not fetishizing tragedy that pop culture has done for 400 years about native existence. These are kids that are living for the future. They're living yeah. as superheroes, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. All of these amazing, uh, you know, incredible artists and writers. Mm-hmm. That's always what I got to say. Support them. Do that work. There's too many to list. I would list you all because, you know, I love you all out there. But, like, there's too many lists. But go find them and support all of these indigenous nerds and native creatives doing, like, this cutting-edge amazing work. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, Johnny, you can get the last word. And then we're going to open this up for some pres- uh, some uh, good questions. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think about, you know, we're doing this right now and uh, – I got these younger generations that are watching this and they're going to come up behind us and, and 
take what we've got started and go with it, you know. Um, and that's amazing to be able to do this and, and know that somewhere down the road, some younger person is going to see, like I did with the older artist, you know, um, the Woody Crumbos, the AC Blue Eagles, uh, yeah. the TC Cannons, you know, the more recent artists who were uh, started these things and, and passed them down. And then, you know, they've got it from older people. And now we're at that, we're starting something here and we're passing that down and someone's going to take that and go with it. So this is just the beginning. And, and you know, it's, it's just great to be, you know, a part of this and uh, know that we're passing this down. We're telling our stories and we're coming in, you know, a new perspective. You know, we're taking what's old, making it new. And it's just going on. It's, it's just a wonderful thing. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. Thank you, John Hamill. I mean, I think you're right on target. Um, you know, so here's a question that, that has been asked, and I'll just throw it out and you kick it around. It says, uh, the question is, what are some ways that writers and artists can include Native Americans in their stories, films, comics, etc., etc., without it being uh, this kind of performative act. Uh, I think you know what I mean by performative here. I'm using performative in that sense of uh, um, somewhat stereotypical notions of, you know, oh, here's what we're, here's the Indian part now, that kind of thing. I think the one of the best ways that non-natives can write indigenous people is to first ask themselves why. Um, why is this person native? Are they mm -hmm. native just for the sake of saying you have a native character? Um, is their nativeness important to the story? Um, just ask yourself why you want to include this character. Why is mm -hmm. it important to the story? Um, mainly because so much of the time, native characters are just in there for the sake of saying, look, we have a native character. Yeah, or yeah. Native elements are in there just for the sake of saying, oh, we have a native theme here. You know, we really mm -hmm. wanted to use dream catchers or, you know, these stereotypes, but there's really no real purpose. It doesn't add anything to the story. Um, and for the most part, they never really let native characters or even our issues just be. Um, like, they're never just allowed to exist like they're always there mainly to drive the narrative of the non-native characters um mm -hmm. you know they're always serve as a tragic figure they're the sacrifice the person who dies so a white person can learn a lesson <laughs> um you know and that's that's not a healthy way to view mm -hmm. native people or to treat us even in fiction um because we already know that people see us and this government sees us as expendable and so I yes. think it's a very important question that creatives need to ask themselves is why. And if, mm -hmm. you know, this story is important or this character is important, collaborate with Native people. Make sure that you are mm -hmm. talking to Native people, that you're if making it tribal specific so that these aren't mm -hmm. just Native American, because there's no such thing as just a Native American. You know, <laughs> we're part of communities and tribes and that mm -hmm. shapes who we are. Um, and so it's important to get that right, um, to let people know that this, you know, this is who this person is and make sure you're collaborating and you're actually listening to Native people. So many times creatives will bring a Native on board as a consultant mm -hmm. and then not take any of their advice and still want to do their own thing, but then use the consultant as their scapegoat when they get criticized by Native people for, you know, the bad representation when they're getting called out, you know, then they throw the native consultant under the bus. And I've seen that happen um, in the comic industry. <laughs> a very wonderful native elder got kind of thrown under the bus when somebody that he had consulted with on a comic book really messed up. And in dressing that, you know, it was like, but I had a native consultant just trying to right. kind of calm the conversation down. But then the consultant came out and was like, listen, I had to quit this project because they weren't listening to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they weren't taking my advice. So I think the right. best thing that non-natives can do is just collaborate with Native people and really listen. Yeah, yeah. 
Other thoughts? Other thoughts on this topic? Yeah, Lee. Oh, I got. I beat you to it. Ha ha! I am <laughs> faster. Um, con. <laughs> um, there you go. There's a little bit of Star Trek love for y'all. Um, I mean, I'll 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 kind of echo those thoughts, and also remembering that when when you bring in native characters, it's not about bringing a character, not the culture, right? Mm. The culture is a part of who we are. It's not the food, feathers, and fun. Yeah, yeah, because it, yeah. And we're one of the very few groups that doesn't, you know, like, if you bring in a Native character and you're just like, they're going to go to the power and they're going to teach us some sacred Native stuff and all the rest of that. I was like, so when you write a Black character, are you just like, they go to the picnic and it's fried chicken and watermelon? Like, <laughs> yeah, right. these are things yeah. that we should have gotten rid of a right. hundred plus years ago. Mm -hmm. So it seems that it's not acceptable for one group, but it's very acceptable yeah. for ours. And folks got to remember that like you write, write a character. I saw, I did a review, a, a consultancy review for a book. I can't remember one of the, it was one of the big five. And they had some characters that were native that came out of it. And they were just like regular. They were like seafaring folks. They helped the main character. They were, they were side characters and that's okay. You don't have to have a main character as a native character. They were side characters. Mm -hmm. But they were literally just kind of like they helped the main character kind of get through from one point to another. They were just working, doing regular work stuff. The mm -hmm. dad was like a little more traditional. The son was a little, or no, I think it was the dad was a little more contemporary. The son was more traditional, you know, mm -hmm. so they had kind of like there was a flip in terms of the vibe that we normally get, right? So the elder was not like the sacred elder. It was like the kid was trying to be a little bit more. And they were helping the main character get from one point to another because the characters run running away from home. And it was, it was like, I remember reading it and it wasn't my community. So I, you know, was and trying to enlist help, but I was like, I give general types of things. And I was like, Hey, you know what? Like, this sounds, this is really good. I was like, this is really refreshing to read the fact that I'm like, they're not going mm -hmm. to like, you know, like we're going to be, we're going to a sacred potluck now. Right, you right, will yeah, now yeah. have to say <laughs> the sacred potluck chant with us. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah. I was like, Man, I don't yeah. shoot. I got it. I was like, I got a dog wandering around the back. I got nerd stuff. I'm playing video games this afternoon. I'm not doing, I'm not playing sacred video games. I'm just playing video games, you know? So I think that that, you know, any type of thing is when you're including native folks, that's one thing is write characters and two, always check in with the folks that you're going to write about. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, even if it's regional, even if they're like, you don't have to, like, you don't have to write, you know, pure historical fiction. But if you're going to write like a Plains tribe, you know, and it could be a fictionalized Plains tribe. Right. Go talk to somebody. Go talk to a Lakota elder, a Comanche elder, a Shawnee elder, a, you know, Pony <laughs> elder. Go talk to somebody from that community and just get a sense. Walk that land. Go with those right. people. Be a part of that. So that's my biggest advice for anybody that it's not performative. Because when you start writing people and you start right. checking with people, learning those stories, you're going to write better anyway. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Johnny, you have any thoughts? Yeah, you know, when uh, I'm, I'm thinking of characters, I'm, I don't, stereotyping is, I don't know, I, I just, when I wake up, I don't think any stereotypical thoughts, I just wake up, I'm just myself, so I figure these characters are going to be doing what it is they do in the mornings, you know, um, it may be you get up early in the morning uh, to pray, that's an 80 thing, but it's not a stereotype thing because there's plenty of natives to be asleep until noon. Um, you know, it's just what you do. And so, um, you know, I try to stay away when I'm um, coming up with things, certain things. Um, like I was working on the ones, like, like I was talking with Lee about the relocation. There's certain things, you know, um, you put in there that native people do. It's not a stereotype. It's just what we do. It's a cultural thing. But then again, it's written from a native perspective about native people. So these things aren't really stereotypical. It's just what we do. And so, um, so sometimes I don't know what might be perceived as stereotypical because I'm just doing what I do. <laughs> and someone who's non-native may see that and say, oh, all Indians do that. And so yeah, they may yeah. want they, they may not understand. Well, how come all your characters aren't like that? And it's like, well, it, it kind of reminds me of a story. I worked with a guy uh, years ago. We, we were both the same tribe. Uh -huh. 
And one of my co-workers who was non-native asked me, how come we didn't look alike if we were the same tribe? And I said, well, it's the same reason you, and I pointed out another non-native co-worker, I said, the same reason you two don't look alike. And uh, it was a, a light came on in, from me, you know, and I, I think sometimes people stereotype these things and they expect certain things. And like we were talking about earlier, when they don't see that in art, they don't accept that. So, you know, there's... There is a little bit of stereotyping, but is it re really stereotyping if you put certain native inflections and things? If you're a native person, you're going to put that in there. You're coming from your culture. Um, it's when other people do that, they want these things in there because that's what they expect in there, and that's where the stereotyping gets, you know, a little nutty because then they like this from a culture they like that and Indians do that too we do that yeah. we'll see something some other Indian does oh I like that and you know and so we, we adopt it as our own but uh yeah I mean I, I probably got off track here because that's what I do <laughs> just, I just wander you know but yeah I mean uh, stereotyping I, I try to stay away from it, or what could be perceived as stereotyping when I when I write my stories out for my my things that I do. Uh, my paintings pretty much is a stereotype. It's uh, culturally based, so there, I don't right. see any stereotyping in it. <laughs> right. Now, if I went around and did a lot of headdresses and stuff, yeah, I'd be stereotyping then. If I did a lot of plains work and you know and dressed like a plains Indian when I went out and did things, yeah, I bet that, that I could see stereotype. That would be stereotyping on my part. That would be you know that, that's not right. And I tell people if you want work like that, there's artists from those tribes that are fantastic that do that. Go go to them for that. But you know if you want Muscogee work, I'm your guy for that. I'll do that. That's true and it's rep. rep Representative and honest to who we are, and that's that's what I that's what I do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think part of this is is addressed by the fact that I really I really like the point. You know, um, write the character. Don't try to write the culture. You know, that's it. Because uh, and and this does pose a a problem for people who are not connected in any way with people that they want to include in something. Uh, they don't have any knowledge of what that character by being Dene or Pueblo or Comanche is going to bring with that if they play it real as, as they are. And so I do think we're fortunate now that I think for the most part, we've passed the day to where they're having non-native people play the native warriors, the native this, the native that. And that's definitely, I think, yeah, uh, we've, we've moved past that, I hope, I hope. Uh, uh, but I think that, you know, you guys are opening up something now that I, I've, I've been wanting to ask, but I know it's going to be another, this will be <laughs> indigenous too. Okay. Once we get into this critical nerd theory, then I think it starts to ask, we can start asking some really good questions about the audience. So when you're writing, you know, are you writing to just a native audience? Are you trying to write to everyone, you know? And and if so, you get into this interesting question about sort of things that we may include. Jokes are a perfect example. We're doing these jokes, and but the person who has no connection to nativists, they don't get it. They're going like, what? What was funny about that? You know, and um, I think, do you ever worry about people? taking your jokes, your put-ons, and non-native people going like, oh, yeah, that's true. Okay, now I really understand. And they totally missed it. I mean, they didn't get the point at all. Does that ever worry you? Just not worry about it. You go like, hey, if they watch enough of this stuff, they'll they'll catch on. They'll get the joke. 
What do you think? I mean, that, that happens. I mean, I've, I've had that happen with my artwork. I, I did a painting of a fishing scene where we use a fishing medicine, and uh, it was a serious scene. It was an old flat-style painting, and I took it to a show, and, and people thought it was funny. They thought it was a comedy piece, but I didn't understand why they thought it was funny because there was nothing funny about it. Um, but it was one of those kind of things where I painted the culture, I painted what I knew, and they didn't understand it, but it was a teaching moment. And these things come up as a teaching moment. It gives you the chance to open up that dialogue to explain, like you're saying, then they get it, and then it brings them in, and then they understand us, and, and it's more accepting. Then they say, oh, I understand. And that's what I did with that painting. I explained it to them. They never, they didn't know what it meant. And then when they found out that it, it, they grew as a person, you know what I mean? They, they got a little more knowledge, and I felt good that I did share who we are as a people, and that's part of what my work is, sharing with my people and with other people. Yeah. And I think it's funny when um, a lot of non-natives don't necessarily get the joke, um, because that just makes it funnier for us as natives, you know, especially <laughs> like with smoke signals. You know, we have yeah. a running joke of <laughs> we know who's native because we all know who Victor is. <laughs> yeah. you, know? you bring up Victor, every native knows, but non-natives are like, who's this Victor guy? And, <laughs> you know, I, I really love native humor and the way that it's being added into pop culture. Res Dogs is a good example recently with the owl. And mm -hmm. I just want to, you know, kind of show you <laughs> kind of the joke here, which was when they had a censored owl, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And I really love that scene because, you know, so many people were just like, I don't get it. You know, and natives yeah. were dying because we yeah. all understood. And the memes that came out of that moment, you know, were just so hilarious. You know, even me, I'm, I'm our clan. And so, like, I have a little meme where it's like, you know, when other natives find out you're out clan and they're all walking by, like, <laughs> you, know, like <laughs> you know, but, you know, and I, and I joke about it too, you know, like, I'm always like, yeah, I'm that native who's not above going out your window and who in like an owl, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> because, you know, natives, like, we have humor and we deal with humor in such a, yeah. and our humor is just weird. Um, yeah, I love native humor because it never yeah, makes I, much sense. I've, and I've got a feeling that probably uh, maybe next year we, we should have a, a little discussion about humor. That would be a, <laughs> that would be fun. That would be a really yeah. Fun. But I, I well, really love you know that we have our moment for native humor because it is a teachable moment. If we if they mm -hmm. don't get it and we explain it then we're like, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, okay, you know, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it also makes them more engaged with us mm -hmm. because they, you know, I feel like a not, lot of non-natives, you know, they really do want to know more no. about who we are as people uh, beyond those stereotypes. Mm -hmm. You know, they want that authenticity just as much as we do. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, it's just native humor. I think just right for you. Um, you yeah. know, if you're writing for a community, write for your community and don't worry about, you know, if people get it or don't get it, because there's always a moment where you can explain it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, folks, this has been a great discussion, but believe it or not, I mean, uh, the program's got to move on. So I want to thank uh, every one of you, both, both Johnny's, uh, Weody, Lee. Uh, I tell you what, this has been a real, a real pleasure having, uh, being a part of this discussion with you all. So, um, uh, uh, until next time. Okay. We'll call it a wrap. <laughs>